Good evening and welcome to episode 6 of Ultima Stream Live. Tonight we're going to be heading over to Boulder, Colorado to meet up with one of the founders and CEO of PS Audio, Paul McGowan, and the company's senior analog designer, Darren Myers, to learn a little bit about the company's history and about some of the latest products. Paul, I wonder if I can start with you. The company, I think, uh, has been going since 1973, 74. Uh, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you started and um, what the sort of products were that you were that you were marketing at that point. Sure, uh, the company, yeah, in seventy three, seventy four, I was a disc jockey at a local radio station and playing rock and roll music, and I was also at the time. Uh, invested in designing and building the world's first polyphonic synthesizer. So back then, synthesizers were known as one note wonders. They you hit one note and there were voltage controlled keyboards and you know they, they only did one. So I had this wild idea because I was very interested in synths to build one that was basically an assignable keyboard that had 12 analog synths and then you would assign the various notes to one of 12 uh, uh, or, I'm sorry, 10. That's right. We only have 10 fingers. And that business, you know, it got me into electronics and interested in stuff. And uh, I won't go into all the details on it, but that, that business and my wonderful skills as a businessman lasted about six months before it collapsed. And in the ensuing point, as I was a DJ at this station, the station manager said, hey, do you, you know about all this electronic stuff, right? And I said, um, sure. And he said, we, we need these new things called phono preamplifiers for each of the turntables because we hadn't passed the FCC's requirements for noise. So I designed a phono preamplifier uh, on the cheap out of a, a little book called the IC Cookbook. And uh, built it, installed it into the into the uh, studios, we passed FCC, I got a few bucks for it. And during that time I had wondered, I wondered, cause it sounded pretty good on my stereo system. I had a, an AR turntable, the old, you know, suspension AR turntable and yep. a pair of uh, phased array speakers. And it sounded good on my system. And I wanted to hear it on, on a fancy system. So one of the radio stations sponsors a company called Ball Waterbed Company. You can imagine what they sold. Um, had uh, was the local was one of our sponsors, and uh, he was a, a local stereo nut. So I took my my little phono preamplifier, which was built into a Roytan cigar box, and was powered by two nine volt batteries. And to his stereo system, he took one look at it. And he said, "You ain't gonna hook that damn thing up to my system." Uh, and he said, but I know somebody who would probably let you do it. And his name is Stan. So I got to meet Stan Warren, who would become my partner, the S of PS Audio, and played the little phono preamp for Stan. And he was very impressed. It, it really sounded quite a bit better than his Dynaco Pat 4 preamplifier. And about a month later, Stan came over to our, our little house. And when we were very broke at this time, just not making any money. And he laid 500 bucks down on the table and said, I want to buy half your company. You mean the synthesizer company? He goes, no, 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 the, the stereo company, the one we're going to start. And we'll call it Paul and Stan. I said, what do we make? He said, we'll make those little phono boxes. I said, really? I took the $500 and said, we're in partner. So that was, that was the beginning. And, uh, and we started, it took us about a year to figure out how to actually turn that into a product. But we started selling those little boxes, the little, they, it was one of the very first separate phono preamplifiers. We sold it for $59.95 with a money back guarantee. And over the next 45 or so years, we slowly but surely built the company into the, uh, what it is today and today we've got 50 people um you know a 30,000 square foot building i mean so we're, it's 
it's quite a bit more than what we started out with. Uh, but uh, hey, it all started out with 500 bucks. So, and then we, along the way, we've been able to hire extremely talented people like Darren and uh, people actually know what they're doing, uh, other than me, who just plays at it. You went on after the designing the phono preamp to produce something, was it called the Model One Power Amplifier? And then you left the company for a while, and then you returned, I think, sort of towards the end of the 90s. In 1990, um, I got uh, uh, an offer from a good friend of mine, Arnie Nudell, who was the founder of Infinity. And Arnie had uh, gotten into a big fight with a guy named Sidney Harmon, who owned... um, well, he owned Infinity and he owned JBL and, and you know, Harmon Motive. And, uh, and they'd gotten into a big fight and parted ways. So Arnie was no longer part of Infinity. And he called me up and he said, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't you sell your company and come make speakers with me? And I thought, what the hell? That's great. And at that point, PS Audio 1990 uh, really had never done great. We were two million, three million dollars a year in annual revenues, always struggling. I always lost sleep every two weeks when we tried to make payroll. And I hadn't yet figured out that I wasn't good at everything. I could design products, I could figure out how to, you know, sell them, but I didn't know how to run a business. And um and what I did know was pretty bad. So at that point I sold the company to two guys, Steve Jeffrey and, and uh, uh, Randy Pat, And they, they took PS Audio, and for the next seven years, they actually did really well with it. They, they built it up. That's when the Lambda came out, the, um, oh, uh, the Ultralink. They hooked up and actually bought a company called Ultra Analog that w- made the, the modules for that, for that DAC. And it was, at the time, it was pretty high-end stuff. And I went off to Colorado and built speakers uh, uh, genesis technologies with arnie in in a partnership that lasted about seven years uh until we discovered that that two uh, crazy uh type a bulls um didn't didn't do too well <laughs> together <laughs> and and nearly killed each other uh and in the meantime ps audio had gone like this i mean they got up to six million or so um which you know for a, a, a small company was not bad and then they they disintegrated as partners and it just it went nuts and i finally wound up buying the company back in 1997 for one dollar and i think when you came back you sort of got back into high-end audio and then that's when the ac regenerators started to come online so that was i guess that was sort of forming the base for for where the company is now with high-end audio products and and mains regeneration yep yeah i I decided when i got back in that i didn't really have anything i felt was really valuable to offer the hi-fi world that was different enough um, that made sense to restart the company and i'd had this crazy idea to fix AC power, not just filter it like a, a power conditioner. Because you know every power conditioner I had ever used always was a double-edged sword. Whenever I hooked a power conditioner up, the first thing I thought is, wow, that's clean, that's, that's, that's better. And then as I kept listening to it, I thought, it's also lacking. It's, it sucked all the life out of, I mean, it, it took away the, um, the, the upper level details that, you know, the rich harmonics that when you pluck a string and the string vibrates over a long period and it has this nice decay, that just sort of got wiped away like a, with an eraser. Uh, and it always fascinated me that it was cleaner and yet it seemed to scrub away too much of the detail. And there had to be a way to figure that out. And, and that's where the idea for the regenerator came in, which had the exact opposite effect. So when you did that, it enhanced all of that. It, it brought that to life. So that was the first product we came out with. It was called a, a power plant. And then skipping on a few years, I think the direct stream DAC 
you bought out uh, it's a Ted Smith design back in 2014. And that uses uh, uh, an FPGA, a, a um, field programmable gate array. Always get the words the wrong way around. Um, and, and it's a fantastic product because I've seen over the last few years where you've... Um, where you've bought out various software updates, which basically give the customer an improved sound quality um, and a, a difference in sound. So without having to sort of upgrade their actual DAC, uh, they're, they're getting the upgrades from the design work that's been going on at PS Audio uh, by way of a download. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the beauties of an FPGA is because it is field programmable. The, the entire structure can be rebuilt with just a simple SD card that is reprogramming the device. And uh, as people may or may not know, uh, an FPGA is basically just a whole bunch of gates, millions of these gates that can be assigned to be logic gates. They can, uh, you can do pretty much memory. I mean, you can do anything you want with it. And Ted is an amazing engineer. And he, it, it started dawning on us as we, he would send us, you know, fix this problem and we'd listen to the fix, which is all software based. He would just change the number of filters or the taps or, you know, the way he was uh, upsampling or whatever he was doing. And it would sound tremendously different. So every, every one of these changes, we'd go, holy crap, this is like a different DAC. And it dawned on us at one point that um, this was so significant. It wasn't just a little change that we could actually give a new DAC to our customers, you know, once every six months or once every eight months or whatever the time period was. And, and we weren't going to charge for that. We just, because I know a lot of well, other companies with similar technologies will do that, but then they charge for it. And we just, we're a very community oriented company. We're very involved in what we call our hi-fi family. And all the owners of PS Audio are, you know, they're, they're like family. So we wanna do stuff like that. So it, it makes it really cool. Now, if we have to do a hardware change, we're obviously, you know, that we're gonna to have to charge for, but software changes, nah, those are, those are fun. Uh, and then, then the debates start going, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, this is great, but I don't like that, and I don't like this. And Right, Darren? I mean, it's... Yeah, you get the, you get the guys who, uh, you know, they're like, well, I'm a, I'm a V1 guy, not a V2 guy. Maybe, like, the software was issued <laughs> twice, and they're like, does anybody have a V1 to share, you know? The v I want the V1. Exactly. So you get a little bit of the subjective side of stuff where people do have favorites, um, but generally, going up as we release the software, the the overall performance improves, and it becomes a it what is um, seen as a, like a better performing DAC, you know, better separation, uh, uh, more accurate tonality, um, and better sound staging, mm -hmm. and sometimes the the improvements have been so drastic that I've had to call up Ted and say, what do you do? You know, and he'll, he'll be like, well, I decided to rewrite the whole PCM to DSD converter inside. I'm like, oh, that would do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you have a whole new part section of the DAC. It's like putting in a new, a new IC in the, in the DAC itself. So it's, you know, these are major changes that the customer gets to um, you know, go on a journey and and see their DAC go from the DAC that they bought four years ago to the DAC that they own now, which is cutting edge and it's it's fun. Without giving too much away, I think that the sales of the direct stream are, are in the thousands. Oh yeah, oh in many many thousands. I think the next range that you introduced was the BHK range, and I think that the the amps have got. Uh, dual vacuum tube technology. So was this your first first move into valve amplification? Yeah, I mean, I've always been a fan of valves. I mean, I love the way they sound. I just hate the idea that 
They are so variable. They're microphonic. They they die over time. They you 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 can change the entire sound of it with different valves and different manufacturers of the same valves. The way you I mean it, it is it's maddening. And I as much as I always loved them, I never wanted to build a product based on that because it just seemed too squirrely. And but again, I always loved the sound of, of valves. And when this took place, it was my old partner Arnie. Who, and uh, so uh, Baskin King was Infinity's engineer for years uh, and, and a very good friend of mine, a very good friend of Arnie's. And uh, I, I had been designing a power amplifier. I wanted to take up, we had the um, C250. I think that was the amplifier at the time. And I wanted to build something that was state of the art, just that would just kick, kick butt on that. And I tried two completely different design topologies over a nine month period. And none of them was, I was happy with. I just, this was better here, but it wasn't as good. And I, I was pulling my hair out. I didn't know where to go. And I was having dinner with Arnold and he said, well, why don't you bring Bascom in? And Bascom knows how to design amps. And Bascom had just designed the Constellation series of, of power amplifiers for Constellation Audio. And they were really pretty killer sounding. That's all solid. And so I hooked up with Bascom and he said, I'll consider it. He said, but if you want my name on it, it's going to have vacuum tubes. And I said, all right, I'll make you a deal. You prove to me that that damn thing is going to be better because I, I won't have a vacuum tube output stage. There's no way. It just, I, I don't like it. I don't like output transformers. I don't like Nothing to do with it. But an input stage, okay, that kind of makes sense. So I said, we're going to have a dual. I'll design my own input stage where I'm going to go high voltage. Um, it's going to be all FET, and it's going to kick ass on your tube. And we'll put it onto a tube socket, and then we're and you design your best tube circuit, and then we're going to have a shootout, and it'll be total blind. You won't know what you're listening to. There'll be the exact same gain. And our chief engineer at the time, Bob Stadther, still is, he and I came up with this high voltage um, uh, MOSFET design that ran off the same voltage that the vacuum tube, the, the valves did. And we had a shootout. <clears throat> it lasted about two hours. We listened to all kinds of music with, and none of us knew which we were, here was A, here was B. And at the end of it, we just tallied up our scores and B, absolutely hands down one and you can guess what it was it was the vacuum tube so i just said we are building products with vacuum tube inputs and that's how bhk got launched i think then the the next major step with ps audio was uh, the stellar range um and i think more recently darren you've come on board uh and you've you've designed um some of the new products um can you tell us about some of the some of these? Yeah, so the first products that I uh, designed were the S300 and the M700 designs, uh, the, the amplifiers. And we, at first we were kind of thinking about, you know, what, what direction do we want to go? I mean, do we want to, we were thinking about efficient linear designs, uh, you know, lightly biased class AB designs, uh, and then there was talk about class D's and you know we were uh somewhat worried about going that direction uh but we started to purchase uh various class D's on the market and start to listen to them and you know keep an open mind and and listen to them and the results were that generally there were some decent class D's on the market at the time, but they still had problems. Even the best one that we listened to. Um, I really, really like uh, the uh, 700 watt ice power design. Um, I think that that design was a big leap forward for them. Um, and, you know, it's continued with the 1200, which we just put out. That's even better than that module. But 
at that time, the 700 watt module was the best module that Ice Power had ever done. And it was remarkable. It was better than, than the, the other competition. But it still had problems. Going back to just how I started in audio, uh, which was uh, just being an, a music lover and uh, you know a, a gear freak, uh, putting together systems when I was younger and really getting into high-end audio uh, at a, a pretty early age and building systems and learning about system synergy and learning about how tonalities you know, mix together and equal something different. And that's basically what we do in, when, we, when we make systems. We find gear that has synergy with something else. I mean, you don't wanna put you know, some bright sounding crown class D amp on a set of horn speakers. Everybody knows that. You, know, you, you, put, you put single on a triodes because they're warm, you know, they're forgiving, they're, they have qualities that uh, mate with that speaker's uh, nonlinear characteristics. And so that's essentially what audiophiles do is, you know, we, we, find, we find cables that, that match our systems in our room. And then you have this, this massive problem that starts with your room. So your room has characteristics. If you've ever taken the same system and moved it to another room, you know how much the room pretty much dictates almost everything. And then you have the speakers that have a tonality. And then you have an amplifier that has a tonality. And so we mix everything together. And we do this over a series of, 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 um, of listening and tri trial and error. And we get to a point where we uh, finally arrive to, to a system that is very well balanced and has all the, all the um, characteristics that we, that we love. And so I had developed these skills. and. I wanted to put it in use within and apply it to within the actual component itself. So creating synergy with, with this output stage, which has already been optimized. You know, I can't, I, I, I don't want to increase the distortion on a class D amplifier. I want class D amplifiers to have the lowest amount of distortion possible because that distortion is not good. It's very, very bad. You want to, minimize that amount. You want the designs that have the most optimized feedback mechanisms, which is the reason why that 700 watt module was so good. What I wanted to do was take the input stage and focus on the input stage and use the input stage to balance that out and to give the amplifier a, a sense of, of tonal balance and musicality that seemed to be lacking in all the top class D modules. And that's exactly what we did. We spent a lot of time uh, listening and perfecting that input stage. Uh, and then we, then we moved on to the S300 and did the same thing with the S300. That was a different design. The input stage on the S300 is different than the M700. Why? Because the, the output module is different. And we needed to do different things for that amplifier. Um, and so we've taken that now and we've scaled it up to the M1200, so, which is a better module using the ICE Edge technology. Um, and so it's higher performance. The module sounds better right off the bat than the, even the 700. Um, I mean, of course, it's 600 watts into 8 ohms, 1200 watts in, into 4 ohms. So it's a high power design as well. And we put a vacuum tube in front of this one, and I was able to remove all input uh, circuitry on the ice power board. So it is a vacuum tube directly into uh, the Class D section. The M1200s use, use the tube technology. And I know that customers can change the, the tube. Uh, it it uh, takes a 12AU7 tube and... Uh, you can roll that tube uh, to your liking. Um, you can't really go outside of that tube type. Uh, we recommend you stick to 12 AU7 and 12 AU7 variants. Like so, you can use you know you can use military mil spec versions of 12 AU7 or Russian versions of 12 AU7. But you gotta stick within the tube type. 
but you you are free to roll and roll it to your liking. And then I think you've also been involved in the um, the Stella Regenerator and the the new Phono Stage as well. Yeah, so uh, we put out a Stellar Phono Stage uh, last year. And uh, that's a cool design that has, it's very flexible with uh, loadings and, uh, and gain selection. Uh, you can do it via a remote from your chair, which is something that in that price range isn't seen too often. Um, it's a fully discrete design. It's uh, very transparent, very open, and has uh, just a wonderful soundstage. Uh, uh, that design was uh, something that, you know, I put a lot of work into and uh, uh, we're very proud of the result of it. And it's, it's been selling very well and doing really well. So yeah, very, very happy with that. Yeah. It's killer sounding. I, it was really fun being part of the, the evolution. I, I mean, Darren went through so many uh, different changes and, uh, I mean, it just just to watch the evolution of that go on. I mean, at one point, um, he was almost done with it and decided it just didn't have the transparency that he wanted, and he scrapped it and started over, um, and lowered the feedback and just. I mean, it was it was it was really interesting watching all of that. That that was all Darren. And then we did the uh, we also the Stellar P3 uh, Regenerator, which is taking the technology from the, uh, the higher, the larger uh, regenerators and scaling it down to a stellar chassis design. Uh, so it uses the same technology, the same uh, high efficiency uh, uh, technology that we've developed uh, to keep it fully linear. So there's no switch mode section of, of these regenerators. They're fully linear, but they're 85% efficiency. So you get you get switch mode level of efficiency with the uh, with the noise performance of linear. Uh, you've got the strata as well. Uh, so that was our chief engineer Bob Stather's design, and uh, he he combined the uh, gain cell DAC, which was also his design, uh, and and put an ice power with that, and then you also have the the streaming capability built into that strata integrated as well. So that's a really, really nice product. And we launched that, Paul, when did we launch that? A few months ago? Okay. Yeah, it was like 45 days ago or so. It's been, it's been doing great. People have been it's really killer. happy. Oh yeah. I mean, it sounds, I, you know, I, we probably shouldn't say this, but I, I remember when, uh, uh, but nobody's watching, right? So <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. I couldn't. I can't. I can't resist an opening line, even if I created myself. <laughs> I remember when Darren and I uh, first listened to it. We we listened to the the S three hundred and the gain cell DAC combo, and then we listened to the the Stellar integrated. And both of us looked at each other and said, "Oh crap! I think it sounds better than the combo." Like, well, yeah, in some ways it does. So we'll just let it roll. I mean, it's a it's a wonderful sounding product. I think the first ones are, are, are currently on their way to the UK at the moment. So, okay, looking forward to getting them. Yeah, um, yeah, you'd like that. And then I, I can't really not mention the the TSS. Ah, uh huh. Perhaps you can tell me a, a little bit about that. Well, sure. That'll be the the single most expensive product PS Audio has ever made. I mean, I'll give you a little bit of a background when. I first met Ted Smith. It was through the Gus Skinnis, who is uh, actually now working with PS Audio in, in our facility. We built a, something called Octave Records, where we're trying to bring back great recordings because there aren't that many great recordings out there anymore. I mean, you know, and your uh, Lynn still does some great recordings, and, and there are companies that that do, but they're few and far between. So we're trying to do everything is in DSD on the Sonoma system. And, and that's all through Gus Skinnis. And at the time, Gus uh, just was a good friend. And he ran the Super Audio CD Center where he did all the mastering of these great 
records. Gus rolls up in his, his little, uh, I think he had a Prius or something, and runs out and he goes, Paul, you, you got to come with me right now. And so I got in the car with Gus and I said, what's going on? He says, you got to meet this guy. You got to meet this guy. So I go in and there's Ted Smith. And Ted, Ted's, Ted always wears shorts, never wears shoes, and has this massive beard. I mean, he's, he's, he's a character. And um, Gus said, I know you got to go to dinner. Just listen to this. And he put on one of his master recordings. And, and this is in a, a mastering studio. So, I mean, the resolution here is amazing. And I listened to it and I, I've heard this before. And I thought, yep, I mean, sounds amazing. He goes, all right, now listen to, now listen to it. And they pulled wires and, you know, and listened to it again, sounded identical. And I said, yeah, so what? He goes, that's through that. And so here was Ted and he had this huge board. It's probably, I don't know, that big. It was quite a bit larger than a piece of stereo gear filled with stuff. And I said, what is that? And he goes, it's Ted's new deck, this FPGA thing he's been working on. And it's amazing. And I was just blown away. That's the greatest sounding DAC I've ever heard in my life. Welcome on board, you know. So um, we had to take that giant board and squeeze it down into something that would fit into one of our chassis. And so when DirectStream came out, it was a compromised version of what Ted had originally built with these ultra expensive Jensen transformers. I mean, these transformers he used on the output were three, four, five hundred dollars each, and there were two of them. Um, it, was, it was huge. Power supplies, you know, bristling off the thing. So we had always promised Ted that at one point we would let him go back and just design his heart out without paying any attention to expense and kind of go back to building that giant board. But we still didn't want to have something that big. So what he said is, let me put it in two chassis. I'll have a complete digital chassis and then an analog chassis. And never the two shall meet. So they're connected up with fiber. And these boards are, again, huge. More power supplies than I think anybody's ever built onto a board. Ted's gone absolutely bananas. Um, and that's going to be called the Ted Smith Signature DAC, the TSS. And it's, uh, Darren and I have heard a prototype of it. And it, it is, it's remarkable. It's, it, it truly is remarkable. So we'll, and it's going slow. I mean, it's, it's, these boards are like eight layer boards. They're, oh yeah. Anyway, that's, that's coming up. I mean, Paul, do you, do you lock your designers away? Because I get the impression with Ted that maybe he's somebody that you sort of put in a room and say, yeah, get on with that design. We're going to lock you in until you've nailed it. Pretty much, yeah. We, we, we lock Ted away. Ted lives in Seattle. So it's um, fortunately, because he, uh, he, he comes out here and talks over everybody's head and few of us understand what the hell he's even saying. And then he goes away into his little castle and we never hear from him again. There is an effect where when you're really deep into design that you kind of lock yourself away. Yeah. You know, like there's nothing else that you want to do more than just isolate and, and, and you know, get through some design. And I actually have a prototype TSS here uh, in a system in this house right now. And I'll say it's, it's uh, the DS is sitting up in the corner. Let's put it that way. <laughs> So you're working on another phono stage. Yeah, yeah so it, it's going to be, this, this phono stage is going to be for the perfect wave uh, line. Um, so it's, uh, there's not really much I can say about it as far as uh, specifications or unique things yet. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. But, uh, you know, my bar is very high for it. And um, I'm I'm in the mode right now of souping up my uh, my analog rig to meet this level of uh, a phone stage. Paul, I know that as a, as a company, you're very much in touch with um, the customers. You you do your your posts and your videos, and you've got Copper Magazine. I just really want to say it's great to see that because so many companies aren't in touch with their customers, and I think it's. 
that's important. Do, do, does that take quite a lot of time to do? The uh, YouTube videos are not so bad. Um, I, I typically take one Sunday every two weeks and uh, I'll answer 20 customer questions. And I have um, a young lady who is an intern who then takes them and puts them all together and puts them up on YouTube. So that's actually not bad. And that's, that's been a, an amazing way to reach into our community. So that's pretty quick. The posts, um, yeah, they take a little more time. It's it just, yeah. And, and I answer three to 400 emails a day, which is a lot for, wow. and I do it seven days a week. So that's, yeah, it does, outreach takes, takes a bit of time. But you know, a company is nothing but its team and the people that it serves. I mean, otherwise it's just a big expensive building um, that does nothing. So um, we just, we, we really treat it as family. Right. Well, Paul, Darren, thank you very much for, for joining us for this episode. I look forward to seeing you at some point again in the future. Thank you. That's great. Thank Steve, you. thank you for all you do out there with uh, your communication and, and helping build this community that you've built. So thank you. Great. Thanks. Okay. Cheers. Well, that's about all we've got time for this evening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. I'll be back in a couple of weeks, so I hope you'll join me then. If you'd like any information about PS Audio range of products or about Ultimate Stream, you can visit our website, ultimate-stream.live. And if you'd like to audition any of the PS Audio products, please do get in touch. So, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye for now.